Eric, thank you uh, for the very kind introduction. And um, I will say it, it's particularly special to be here today uh, with a, an audience of so many friends and colleagues that I've worked with over the years in a intimate setting made somewhat more intimate by uh, a little snow and ice and sleet and rain. Uh, so thank you all for coming. And just to um, put a little finer point on uh, Eric's introduction, uh, I literally wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the Joint Center for Housing Studies and for MacArthur. Uh, I was an architecture student at, at Harvard thinking I would design affordable housing, went and took Bill Apgar's housing policy class, uh, ended up working at the Joint Center for Housing Studies the next summer. Uh, when I graduated, I spent another six months at the center, and it really became not just my home, but uh, the place where I discovered my passion and interest in this, in this work. And uh, it's really where uh, I was able to uh, find a love for this. And uh, Eric, you've been a great inspiration and friend to me. Uh, the center has been such a great home and inspiration for me. It's, it's wonderful to be back here today and to be part of this. So thank you. And let's give the Joint Center a round of applause. Uh, I would also just say uh, the MacArthur Foundation has been such a leader in, uh, in this work on rental housing. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether it's five or six different jobs that uh, I've actually gotten grants from the MacArthur Foundation to, uh, to a, a broad range of things. But as, as I was thinking about uh, this, this gathering today uh, and what I wanted to talk about, I really think it's important to recognize that the Joint Center within the academic community, uh, the MacArthur Foundation within the foundation community, have really been the moral conscience on this issue of rental housing. And uh, without the, their work, uh, we would not have the focus that we do today. And it really uh, made me feel that I needed to focus my remarks today on the urgent crisis that we have in rental housing affordability. We have a lot of debates going on uh, about rental housing, about its connection to other things, but the simple fact is that we are in the midst of the worst rental affordability crisis that this country has known, certainly in the records that we've been keeping and the work that uh, the Joint Center has been doing. And um, that is really where I want to focus my remarks today. And um, look, we have been through one of the great economic crises, hopefully the, the worst economic crisis any of us will see in our lifetimes. Um, and that is a major part of the crisis in rental affordability that we're facing today. Um, but it is more than that. In some ways, what we have is a perfect storm uh, that has brought together longer term demographics and change that are driving uh, people to rental housing, and in fact, the report uh, really does a good job, I think, of spotlighting that. Uh, demand increasing by up to 4.7 million uh, uh, rental households over the next 10 years, um, combined with a uh, major shift uh, into rental over an extremely short period of time because of the foreclosure crisis. Again, the report does a good job of pointing this out. Uh, just in eight years, rental housing growing from 35% of, of households to 31% of households, a, a, tra a transformational shift in a very short period of time. And on top of that, uh, you have people's incomes getting crushed uh, during this period. And I, I think what's in some ways the irony of uh, this perfect storm coming together is that the general perception of the world, uh, of the country, is that housing got more affordable. And in fact, it did. In fact, the, the complaint in too many places was that housing was too affordable and that uh, home prices had gotten uh, absolutely uh, demolished by the crisis that we'd seen. But in fact, if you look closely at the numbers, particularly for the lowest income households, throughout the crisis, what we had was uh, affordability burdens going up not down. And so in the midst of the, the broader crisis, 
you have uh, uh, a silent crisis in many ways going on uh, among renters and particularly among the lowest income renters. And uh, we have done our best at HUD to point to this. If you look at our latest worst case needs study, uh, which covered uh, data from 2011, is the most recent study, eight and a half million lower income families paid more than half their monthly income for rent, lived in severely substandard housing, or both. And this was a record high. It was up 43% from 2007, 43% in just four years. Uh, we have never seen that in the history of the work that we've done at HUD, and certainly uh, the work that the, re the report, the Joint Center, MacArthur are doing, and the report that's released today uh, amplify this uh, ongoing and growing crisis that we have. And so as we come together today, uh, we must, I believe, make a central focus of this discussion of our work, this affordability crisis, and particularly at a time when, while this is happening, we have seen an unprecedented decline in support for renter households uh, through the United States budget. Uh, just take one example. Our Home Investment Partnerships Program has been cut nearly 50% between fiscal year 2010 and fiscal year 2013. And so uh, in what I think is a really cruel irony, at a time that we have uh, a growing crisis in rental affordability, to see fewer and fewer resources dedicated to the needs of that population, um, and too often a public disregard uh, for this crisis is something that we all in this room must come together and reverse. Now, if there is good news in this story, it is that I think we have made real progress uh, in our solutions to this crisis. We know, and I want to talk a little bit about, um, how to do a better job of three critical elements around rental housing. Preserving the precious affordable housing that we have, building new units to meet the growing demand for uh, affordable rental, and linking this housing to comprehensive both neighborhood and regional uh, development that will ensure that that housing becomes a platform to opportunity, as the president likes to say, to make sure that it represents a rung on the ladder to opportunity that is so critical uh, to our families and particularly for lower income families today. So let me begin, first of all, just by talking about uh, the efforts around preservation. And again, uh, MacArthur has been such a leader in helping to develop many of these, these policy directions. I, I think first and, and most importantly, um, I have made, the president has made, our single most important budget priority to preserve our investment in our existing rental housing, whether it's around uh, our voucher programs, uh, our public housing, uh, our project-based Section 8 and other programs. We must prioritize over anything else continuing to invest in those, in those programs, and we have done that. And in fact, we are serving at HUD uh, hundreds of thousands more families today than we were four years ago, uh, five years ago, despite uh, the unprecedented budget challenges that we've had. And so I'm enormously proud of that work. But I think it's also important that we have tried to find new and creative ways uh, to uh, improve the both affordability and the condition of uh, affordable rental housing around the country. And I, I just want to take one example of that uh, and talk about today, which is our rental assistance demonstration. We all know that for too long, our nation's public housing stock has been literally falling apart in too many places. There's a backlog of over $25 billion in capital needs, and as a result, we continue to lose about 10,000 units of public housing each and every year uh, due to the disrepair uh, and abandonment. Another roughly 40,000 units of what I call the orphan programs, these are old uh, for many forgotten, for many they never even knew they existed, uh, programs at HUD that are part of 13 different rental assistance programs that we have. The whole alphabet soup of rent, RAP and Rent Sup, uh, Mod Rehab, um, those are also uh, units that we are at great risk of losing permanently 
uh, to our affordable housing inventory. And we took this issue on, recognizing the budget challenges that we had. How can we pre preserve this stock um, while not bringing in uh, new resources? And so what we, ha what we are doing, um, we are well along now in moving uh, this housing to a new platform for funding, taking what has been an effective, uh, broadly accepted platform under project-based Section 8 and converting these units so that we can preserve them for the long term and bring critical new capital to them. Remember that public housing was really the only form of affordable housing in the nation that couldn't, on a regular ba basis, access not only private capital, but also other forms of uh, public assistance as well, whether tax credits or a whole range of other tools, home, CDBG. And so what RAD has done uh, is really a creative way to open the door to public housing authorities, to private owners, um, and allow them to begin not just preserving their properties, but also doing some very creative new things. To date, we have preserved, uh, we've approved about 24,000 units of public housing, about 8,000 units of uh, multifamily housing in need of recapitalization. We have applications now for over 110,000 units uh, that want to convert. And we anticipate that in the, very, in the very early part of 2014, we will have approved about 60,000 units and that will reach our limit, our statutory limit that Congress has given us. So one of the things that I really want to highlight and ask you all to support is to lift the cap that we have of 60,000 units uh, up to at least 150,000 units in the budget deal that's getting negotiated as we speak on Capitol Hill. And let me just highlight why this is so important. What we've seen so far in uh, the work that we're doing on RAD is about $45,000 uh, a unit, per unit on average, of rehabilitation that's happening uh, to these properties. With just the 60,000 units that we have legislatively authorized right now, we expect to bring $2.7 billion of new capital investment into public housing. $2.7 billion without a single dime of new appropriations. And so, if you multiply that out over the uh, roughly million units of public housing, the potential here is enormous to bring new investment. Uh, we also believe that we ought to have the flexibility to increase rents because, frankly, uh, we are underfunding public housing in too many places. Uh, but even without those increased rents, this is a huge opportunity uh, to invest. And I think what's also important about this, this isn't just uh, a financial engineering tool. Two other things that I think are, are critical about it. One is that by freeing up public housing, releasing it from many of the, the uh, uh, restrictions and requirements that limit its uh, flexibility in, in the public housing system, what we are effectively doing is opening up public housing to become part of the surrounding neighborhoods. In the same way that we've seen choice neighborhoods and other efforts really create mixed income, mixed use, uh, neighborhoods of opportunity. We are freeing up through RAD public housing, whether it's to uh, bring in a mix of incomes, but also, frankly, uh, the, the brain damage we had to go through in New York City just to bring a grocery store into public housing. Those simple steps that uh, begin to in integrate public housing into the surrounding neighborhoods is part of the real potential of the RAD effort, and we are seeing some very, very creative solutions in these applications. The other point I would make is that for too, too often, as housers, we have fought each other for a shrinking pie. It, some support public housing, others support Section 8, others support our block grants. If we can bring and, uh, together the housing community, build a broad tent where public housing authorities, tax credit syndicators, uh, the broad range of owners and managers of, of privately owned assisted housing all come together to support the Section 8 budget, and that becomes the central tool for funding, uh, the central platform for funding uh, affordable rental housing through HUD, we will build a broader coalition, political coalition, to support the funding for these units. Part of the problem for public housing today is we simply don't have a broad enough coalition supporting that funding, and it's why, while se project-based Section 8 has continued to be funded for every single unit in the country, public housing funding has been dramatically cut 
to a level where uh, it's almost impossible for public housing authorities to operate effectively today. And so while this is a financial uh, uh, solution with RAD, it is also, I think, a neighborhood solution and a political solution to the challenges that we have faced. And uh, again, RAD is just one example of the work that I think we have been uh, doing with all of you that has helped bring our work in rental housing to the step where uh, it's more effective, it's more efficient, where it's something that we should be investing uh, significantly more in. On the, on the new construction side, though, I, I also want to uh, focus for a moment because uh, recognizing there has been remarkable work in that uh, area as well. Um, first, uh, let's all recognize that five years ago, it wasn't clear that we would continue to have tools to build affordable rental housing. Uh, the tax credit market itself was a question. Uh, many of us feared that we would might lose the tax credit uh, completely, that the market would collapse, and that we would have to find a new way to fund uh, affordable rental housing. But in fact, with great work done uh, among the housing community, uh, by Congress, at Treasury, and at HUD, we were able, through the Recovery Act, to save uh, the low-income housing tax credit. And through our work at FHA, which quintupled its volume of lending, we made sure that capital continued to flow uh, to the construction of, of multifamily housing. And, and we should not forget that that was a remarkable effort, a remarkable response among all of us who care about rental housing uh, in the crisis. Now we've got to continue to find ways to make it much easier uh, to build and refinance uh, rental housing in a range of different ways. And we are doing that at HUD. Uh, and again, let me take one example. Uh, FHA insurance is a remarkable tool if you can get it. And for too long, it has been too difficult for uh, multifamily developers, but particularly affordable housing developers, to access FHA insurance. And so we've made a concerted effort to improve the work that we do, to fundamentally restructure uh, the way we operate. And the best example of that is our low-income housing tax credit pilot program. Um, in the old world, it could take a year or more to get to uh, approval and closing for a deal. And as bad as that was in adding costs, uh, stalling the development of critical affordable housing, even worse was probably that we scared off so many developers that didn't even think about using uh, FHA as a tool in the first place. And so this pilot program has begun to reverse that. And uh, you are hearing this correctly. Uh, I will repeat it if, uh, if uh, folks don't believe it. But on average, we are going from application to closing in 86 days with this pilot program for the low-income housing tax credit uh, project. Now, it's 13 projects so far. Uh, it's 1,500 units, so we haven't changed the world yet. Um, but this is, I think, uh, part of a broader effort to make FHA insurance a truly relevant tool, not just for multifamily housing more broadly, but particularly for affordable rental housing. You know, there was uh, some sense, including me, that for most of the HUD building, uh, we operated as if the low-income housing tax credit had never been invented uh, five years ago. And, and I think we are finally beginning to get to a place where the tax credit has become a central part of the way that we think about, and our partnership uh, with Treasury has gotten much stronger around the policy on it. Um, another critical part of this effort is around the transformation of our office structure in multifamily. Uh, as all of you know, uh, we operate as if uh, it was still 20 or 30 years ago with over 70 multifamily offices, uh, a real lack of consistency, ability to deliver, to share work across offices. And so we are moving toward a much more streamlined, much more effective office structure, something uh, we hope to begin uh, implementing. We're now sharing information with our employees, getting feedback from them. We hope to begin implementing in the early part of, uh, of next year. But the simple uh, reason for this is that we simply cannot force uh, owners of multifamily housing to wait, uh, whether it's weeks for answers about whether they can get a waiver or a change, or months or even years to get deals approved. We can and we must do better at HUD, and I think we are on the path to doing that. Now, uh, finally, I want to touch on an area uh, where uh, and I will give a lot of credit uh, to the Joint Center and to MacArthur. Um, the, we all know 
that the small landlord is really the unsung hero of the rental housing market. Um, the Joint Center and MacArthur have been saying this a long time. But too often, uh, the work that we do on, in the federal government has a very hard time reaching those small landlords. Um, they make up, uh, and those small buildings, they make up about a third of all rental stock if you look at the 5 to 49 unit uh, stock. And yet, as I said, too often they have been neglected. Uh, we all know this from experience. I lived in a triple decker when I was a graduate student uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I became the landlord of a three family brownstone in Brooklyn when Brooklyn was still affordable. Um, and uh, this is, we all know in our own experience, uh, whether as policymakers or just in our own lives, that this is a critical part of the affordable rental stock. Um, but particularly in financing it uh, and delivering subsidies to it, it has been too hard to do in the past. And so we have, uh, just on November 4th, published uh, a small multifamily buildings risk sharing initiative, taking existing authority that we have, working with uh, uh, mission-oriented uh, lenders out there. We are going to make it easier through this pilot uh, to finance these 5 to 49 unit buildings. And so um, what I want to make sure all of you are doing that care about th uh, this stock and the work that we're doing in it is to get us comments on that notice, let us know whether it's working, it's in the Federal Register, uh, what can we do differently. I would also ask that you support two legislative changes that we are uh, actively seeking that would allow us uh, to use Ginny May uh, to be able to securitize better these, uh, these mortgages and to make sure that we have an affordability uh, set of requirements that work for these small buildings. Uh, we have legislative requirements that require basically tax credit affordability. And as you all know, for these smaller properties, that can be very hard uh, to implement. So giving us uh, more flexibility to create uh, an affordability strategy that works for these small properties is a key part of our effort. Finally, let me just touch briefly on the work that we're doing to try to connect rental housing uh, to both neighborhood and, and regional development. Um, the thing that I loved about housing policy when I took Bill Apgar's class and I started working at the Joint Center, and it's something we all know, that when a family chooses a home, they choo they're choosing much more than shelter. They are choosing job opportunities, access to decent jobs and transportation. They're choosing what school their kid's going to go to. They're choosing uh, public safety. So many critical factors of what creates opportunity in our society are determined by where you live. And that means that decent, safe housing uh, that ensures our health, uh, strong neighborhoods that ensure access to opportunity must be a critical part of our strategy. And as the President said uh, far more eloquently than I ever could in uh, his speech last week, uh, we have an enormous responsibility as a country to attack the roots of a growing inequality in our country. And place uh, where people live is an increasing part of what drives that growing inequality in our country. Uh, we know today that a child born into the top 20% uh, of our income, uh, of our incomes, has a two in three chance of staying in that top 20%. Today, a child born into the bottom 20% has less than a one in 20 chance of making it uh, to the top quintile. That is simply unacceptable. And let, let me put this in a different way related to place. We have too many neighborhoods, about 4,400 neighborhoods of concentrated poverty in this country. For children growing up in those neighborhoods. No matter how hard, uh, how well they do at school, no ha matter how hard their parents work to help them get ahead, for those kids, the single most important determinant of their life chances, even their lifespan, is the zip code they grow up in. And it is simply wrong in this country that you can put a child's address into Google Maps and predict their future. And so we must attack this inequality starting with making sure these communities of concentrated poverty have real opportunity. In the next few weeks, the President will launch our Promise Zones initiative, 
which builds on fantastic work that we've done in choice neighborhoods, in promised neighborhoods, in a range of other efforts, uh, calling on Congress to add tax incentives to those focused efforts. And we will bring 10 different federal agencies to the table that will all focus their efforts on these chosen promise zones in rural, suburban, and urban uh, neighborhoods. And we are asking you, we've asked to quadruple our funding for these key initiatives, promise neighborhoods, choice neighborhoods. We're asking for your support in the budget uh, agreement that's coming up. But I would also ask you to support our efforts to link these neighborhoods of poverty to broader regional opportunity. Uh, over just a few years, we've now provided 143 different planning grants to neighborhoods and regions that are home to half the American people through our Sustainable Communities Initiative. What is this doing? It's making sure that when a transit stop goes into a neighborhood, we have affordable housing that gets built, whether it's through inclusionary zoning, uh, TIFs, or other strategies at the local level. And it's making sure that when uh, a region is considering uh, a regional transit system, that we are connecting that system to the neighborhoods with the least opportunity to make sure that the residents of those communities have access to transportation that can get them to better jobs. Um, those are critical parts of the strategy we all, as supporters of rental housing, must support and must push for. And so I'm asking you also to support our efforts in the Sustainable Communities Initiative. So I've, I've touched on uh, a set of initiatives around preserving our rental housing, around building new uh, affordable rental housing, and about how we connect these units to broader opportunity within their neighborhoods and where, within their regions. But let me return to the, the central irony uh, of where I began. At a time where I believe we are making enormous progress, uh, improving our policies, making these programs more effective, the funding that supports these efforts has been devastated. And we must come together as uh, people who support rental housing and reverse that trend. And we have two enormous opportunities to do that within the next few months. The first is around the budget, and the second is around housing finance reform. Look, let's, let's recognize on the budget front that tough times require tough choices. But we have got to make sure that Congress makes the right choices. We've promised to get better results from our programs. I think we have all done that. Uh, some of the work that I've talked about today is helping us make good on that pledge. And yet, despite all of those efforts that we've made as a rental housing community, there are those who continue to propose to balance our budget on the backs of the most vulnerable in our country. This is simply wrong for our nation. We cannot cut our way to growth. We must invest in the things that are going to help us grow our economy and help families overcome the inequality that I talked about and be able to contribute to our economic success. That's why the president continues to push for a balanced solution that closes loopholes, that cuts wasteful spending, but that can also strengthen our entitlements and strengthen the investments in rental housing and other critical tools. Please raise your voices. We have a real chance for the first time in three years to get a budget uh, that not only overcomes sequestration, but begins to reverse the painful cuts that we've seen in the programs that support affordable rental housing. Finally, we have an enormous opportunity, first with housing finance reform and ultimately, I think, with tax reform, to make sure not just that we never face a crisis of the magnitude that we saw the last uh, decade in our housing markets, but also to help us invest in rental housing. And Mike Stegman's going to be here later today. I'm not going to spend time talking about uh, the critical importance of uh, access to credit for building rental housing and preserving rental housing, uh, how we get housing finance reform right. Uh, Mike's going to talk about that. I also know Senator Warner is going to be here. But I do want to make sure that we are all focused on the fact that we have, I think, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build new investment in affordable rental housing. And let me be very specific. Uh, the president proposed in August when he spoke about this, and we will continue to fight for 
a consistent, um, non-appropriated source of funding out of the housing finance reform legislation that yields a major source of new funding for afford uh, the production of affordable rental housing, uh, the preservation of affordable rental housing, and important support for affordable home ownership as well. And when I say major, I mean we should be able to achieve something that exceeds $5 billion a year in a typical year. That is an opportunity, given the budget cuts that we've seen, that if we miss that chance, shame on all of us. This is an enormous opportunity that we must take advantage of. And so, please, uh, whether you're following uh, the debate about housing finance reform closely or not, help us fight for a, uh, the biggest new opportunity we have to invest in affordable rental housing uh, that we've seen in a very, very long time. Um, obviously, we also need to make sure that we're fighting not just to preserve the low-income housing tax credit and tax-exempt bonds, but even to expand them uh, when the debate on tax reform moves to uh, actual negotiations around a bill. Uh, I know you all are focused on that, but uh, I can't uh, be up here speaking about it, uh, about this topic without, without mentioning it. And I will say, um, the President himself mentioned this in his speech in August that we know this is an effective tool, the tax credit, we must fight to preserve it and even expand it uh, as we debate on uh, tax reform. So let me just um, close then by saying again, um, we could not come together at a more critical moment than we see today. This report shows uh, within, without any doubt that we face a crisis of rental housing affordability in this country, and we must take bold action now to meet the desperate needs of America's families. We must come together across the housing community. To do that, we must continue to find creative, innovative ways to meet the growing demands for affordable rental housing, but we also must work together to shape a fairer and more affordable future for all of our citizens. We have that within our grasp in these coming months. We must come together and reach that goal. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Secretary has agreed to uh, take about five minutes of questions. I do want to say that uh, in many uh, calls I've gotten from the press about this issue, I get asked, how do, we, uh, how do we solve this problem? And I think you've laid out a very detailed roadmap. I've said that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and you're a runner, so I know you'll appreciate <laughs> the analogy. Uh, these are problems that have been long developing. They were made worse by the crisis, but even during an economic expansion, we saw a growth of almost one and a half million households spending more than half their incomes on rent. So this is a long-standing challenge. 50 years ago, it was one in 10 households today. It's more than one in four. It's a very serious issue. So with that, um, the Secretary has agreed to take questions. So uh, we have a couple of people with microphones, I think, circulating. Any questions? Shy and retiring. No, we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, Sean. Can you come, uh, Elizabeth, right uh, in the front? Thank you. Hi, Secretary Donovan. Um, you mentioned the expansive operation you have in guaranteeing multifamily loans or loans on multifamily properties. Has HUD, do you have any research going on or any movement on a program to expand HUD financing for single family rental properties? Um, so we do, and, and uh, didn't, didn't touch on it today, focused on the five to 49, but uh, we do have some work, particularly around our 203K program uh, that is going on to look at uh, the ability to finance uh, smaller rental properties. Uh, and uh, that is something that I expect we'll probably have in the first quarter of next year, uh, more specifics on. Any other questions over here? We've got two, and we'll wrap it at these two. Yes, Secretary Donovan. I'm Bryant Mitchell. Um, everything was fine until you mentioned that you needed certain legislation passed. Um, <laughs> maybe I'm a pessimist, pessimist, but when it comes to our Congress passing any legislation now, 
especially if it's in favor of affordable housing, what, what do you foresee as any type of movement on, on this legislation? So um, as the president likes to say, we can't wait. And I hope that from my comments, what you take is we're not waiting at HUD. There's a lot that we can do and that we are doing to uh, try to make progress short of legislation. But um, look, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, we, we can all uh, bemoan, uh, and we do, and uh, I think we'll continue to do it, uh, the gridlock, the paralysis in Congress. Uh, but the fact is, the American people aren't going to take that indefinitely. And I already think you see uh, some uh, movement, just taking the short term, I think it's likely that we get a budget deal. Uh, that's certainly not, uh, uh, don't take it to the bank right now. Uh, it's, we were at the White House yesterday talking about this. Um, there is still a, plenty of chance for things to go wrong, but we need to get back to regular order, reverse sequestration, and begin having progress on the budget front. And we have a chance to get you know, uh, a, a real budget, not a continuing resolution for the first time in, in three years. And uh, that alone, getting the right priorities, as Eric said, we're not going to do it all in one year, but moving in the right direction on housing is, is critical. On, on housing finance reform, and you've got, you know, Mike Stegman's going to be here later, uh, Mark Warner, who's been right in the center of it. I will tell you, um, I am encouraged by what I see, and this is why the president spoke out in August, uh, around the bipartisanship on, on housing. And let's, let's recognize, for a long time, housing has been a bipartisan issue, right? You, you tend to get bridges, whether you go back to the um, Housing Act of 49, where you go back to the Fair Housing Act, Brooke Mondale uh, came together. So we have seen, at various times in our history, strong bipartisanship around housing. And I think there is a real opportunity to get a housing finance reform bill. And I give a lot of credit. Henry uh, Cisneros had to leave. but. The work that the Bipartisan Policy Center did really accelerated the momentum on it to the point where I am hopeful that in January you will see a bill go through committee, um, the Senate Banking Committee, and hopefully get to the floor and get passed on the floor of the Senate uh, that reflects, I think, a very um, positive approach to this, to this issue. Everybody's next question is, well, what about the House? But the fact is that I think we, there is a growing consensus that the status quo cannot stand uh, among Democrats and Republicans. And the greatest risk here is doing nothing. If we end up continuing in a system which is producing great uncertainty, uh, where despite the federal government standing behind Fannie and Freddie loans, they're, they're trading at a much higher level than Ginny May. Uh, loans are and FHA loans are, so it's, it's more expensive than it needs to be, where access to credit has been severely constrained because of that uncertainty, um, and frankly, where the taxpayer is on the hook should we get a crisis again um, because of the, the fundamental flaws in the basic GSE system, I think what you have is a recipe for despite all the craziness and partisanship, where there is a real reason for both Democrats and Republicans to support legislation. And I think the urgency here is that, you know, we all know this, the closer we get to an election day in November next year, the harder it's going to be to get this done. And so it is incredibly important that we get a bill to the Senate floor, uh, try to get it done in January, and move quickly to the House to try to get something. Uh, because I do think the longer we wait next year, the harder it's going to be. All the questions here uh, in the interest of time, and I know the Secretary has a number of other things he has to move on to, but please join me once again in thanking Secretary Donovan. That was a great talk. I appreciate you doing it. Thanks.